there is a, an international convention for the trade in endangered species, CITES, which some of you might have heard of already. And this is a, an international framework which is agreed on by all major international organizations, by you know, a lot of national governments, and this is specifically enacted to you know, protect these endangered species and regulate their trade and harvest in these countries. So all these bans in the UK as well as in other countries, what they are trying to do is move beyond this and say that they know better than these international organizations and this international convention what is best for African countries and how they should regulate their, their wildlife and conservation efforts. However, the Humane Society International says that 90% of the UK don't like trophy hunting and want to see some way of banning it. Uh, yes, they do. And they do this very effectively in a lot of countries. The Humane Society International uh, has been doing a lot of polling. and But if you actually look at the question that they ask, which tends to be, in the UK it was, for example, you know, there's a, a lot of people that, uh, wealthy people that travel abroad and uh, slaughter endangered species and bring their body parts back home uh, to hang on their wall. Do you agree with this, yes or no? It's quite a surprise that 9% said no, actually. You know, and this is, it's all about how you frame the question. In France, for example, they asked a, a similar question where, where they said some people, even French, uh, travel abroad and hunt highly endangered species for pleasure to bring their body parts back home and hang on the wall. And if you frame the question like this, it's, it's you're of course going to get the result you want. And they've been extremely effective in, in answering, in you know, asking these rubbish questions, getting the result they want, and then using it and taking it to the politicians, using it to influence policy. Exactly the same in the UK as in France. In the, in the House of Lords debate, it was consistently mentioned that 90% of the British public are against this, which is actually not true if you actually look at the other results. IUCN, um, uh, the International Union uh, for Conservation, major international body, they did a follow-up poll to the HSI poll with a save, the similar, uh, ex exactly the same polling company and asked a differently framed question and they got out that 40% of the British public were actually appro approving that uh, trophy hunting is acceptable if it is on well-managed land, if it benefits local communities and all parts of the animal are used. For regulated hunting, as we, as we always say. Absolutely, yeah. And 40% well, approving and 33% disagreeing is a very different figure than 90% of the public saying... That's a win for us, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, we're on the same side on this right. one. It's, it's, <laughs> yes. it's, it's very difficult to produce an entertaining piece of game fair theatre where we're both agreeing with each <laughs> yeah, other. Yes. Um, we're not alone in Europe, uh, in, in Europe, are we? Britain is not alone. Other countries are planning trophy import bans as well. This is a coordinated campaign across the continent. Absolutely, and it's all done in exactly the same method as I just mentioned. You know, they get a very rubbish poll, they use it to influence the politicians, and they try and push it through. And with, usually without any objection from the other side, because trophy hunting itself is, it's a bit of a misnomer. I mean, trophy hunting as such has become very tainted in the public imagination, because you tend to imagine a lot of, you know, rich, fat Americans uh, sitting behind a lion, and this is sort of what the general public, also highly influenced by the, uh, the tabloid media to a certain extent, believe that trophy hunting is. But this is, it's, a, it's a very small part of trophy hunting. I mean, trophy hunting is sound game management. It is removing the oldest and uh, most mature animal from the herd uh, in order to regenerate the population. And this is, this is for the, ma the majority of the public, same with game shooting and a lot of aspects of it. It's not, it's not a logical step that most of the public make, that you have to kill something in order to save it. And this is the problem. But we've seen the same with uh, sort of fire management for forests as well. In the US, they banned fire management in forests for 100 years, thinking that it's, it doesn't make any sense that you should burn the forest in order to have it regenerate. And you know, they built up the US into a massive tinderbox with this, and now ended up with a huge amount of forest fires. And it's exactly the same principle, that you know, sometimes you have to sacrifice a pawn to save the queen. And in this case, the queen is nature. I want to ask you a question about, um, I, I think, something that goes to the heart of how we view other countries' wildlife, and that's the, the rhino story in, in South Africa. The illegal trade in wildlife is currently what the problem is, and a large part of the problem on the other side is that they try and conflate hunting with illegal poaching. 
And illegal poaching is a, a much larger part of the problem that, that we currently face. Um, I mean, for example, when they, uh, even under Trump, did the, uh, the uh, masses burning of ivory in New York, and all this does is, is inflate the, the, the criminal market for, for ivory. And all of these conservation organizations have been very quiet on this. All these animal rights, they, you know, they, they massively object to any sort of trade and import, but when it actually give, they, when they are confronted with an opportunity, where they can actually do something to save 2,000 rhinos, they are very quiet. Why is it so difficult to put this across to Europe's politicians, which is your job? Um, because Europe's politicians, same as politicians everywhere, they want to get elected. And they tend to believe, you know, if somebody like HSI, like Humane Society International, confronts them with the figure that 90% of your constituency is against this, they, of course, are, no matter what the science says, no matter what, how many facts you throw at them, their main objective is to get re-elected. And this is the main problem. And that public opinion is allegedly against us, even though when we have done studies in retaliation and done surveys where we frame the question differently and in a more, you know, not just rich people slaughtering animals for their pleasure, endangered animals for their pleasure, um, we end up with very different results that the majority of the public is actually tends to be in agreement with this practice if it's done in such a way that it benefits the wildlife population and the local community. One area of leverage we have perhaps is money and there was an interesting conference last year in Kigali in Rwanda where the conservation industry from Africa and the hunting industry arrived to debate the future of Africa's wildlife, its national parks mm. and the wildlife industry which uh, consists of all the bad guys trophy hunters like us the chinese traditional medicine market the the animal petting zoos where they take lion cubs and pet them until they're no longer cute and then they kill them absolutely they're all all of the really bad guys mm. and and they put forward what's called the consumptive use of wildlife and the conservation industry put forward the non-consumptive use of wildlife argument that you could make a, an annual payment to africa the whole of africa and get all the national parks and all the wildlife you want. The only trouble was our version is free mm. and their version costs 200 billion US dollars a year. Absolutely, and I think it will be quite a challenge to try and get that 200 billion US so dollars a year. You, yeah. you can't, I mean, would it, if you were on the other side, if you were working for Humane mm. Society International, for example, how would you persuade the European Union to stump up half of 200 billion dollars a year for African wildlife, or couldn't you? It's impossible. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> for, there's there's enough issues we currently face on the on the European continent that they you know desperately defend for. There's absolutely no opportunity that any nation would agree to this because it's not seen as having a relative benefit for them. But on the other hand, they have no objection to telling these countries how they should uh, manage their wildlife and their conservation efforts, which is, I mean, from my perspective, and I I hope yours, you know, quite bonkers that that these um, European politicians are telling these African countries what to do as quasi-colonialists quasi to a certain extent and, and actually are refusing to listen to the voices of these African communities and these African governments, the majority of whom reject this argument completely. And we, we, have it, we see it time and time again. A lot of the, the permanent representatives came and spoke to the House of Lords. We had a conference in the European Parliament on wildlife trade not too long ago, where we had a lot of the African ambassadors come and speak. And, and they consistently reinforced the point of how important um, hunting, well, trophy hunting, we try not to use tr the trophy word as such because of the, uh, the bad public image, but how sound game management and foreigners traveling to their country to hunt there, how this is essential to their economy, how local communities depend on this income, and how uh, wildlife conservation in these countries would, in a large respect, not be possible, not be financially viable without this contribution. Um, well, this provides you with another area of leverage. So I sat with an angry Minister of Tourism for Botswana three weeks ago in the High Commission in London, and one of the, the things that angered her is that she couldn't understand why she was having to talk to DEFRA when this was clearly a Foreign Office matter. You know, th th this, is, this is British gunboat Foreign Office policy, this idea of banning trophy imports. So how come it lands up in environment departments? Is this a, is this a point you make? 
Yes, absolutely. This is is it is completely. It's a foreign trade issue, and it's a trade. It's a trade which has been very highly regulated. Uh, CITES was established especially for this, and is agreed by anybody on 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 both sides. Respect CITES as a body, which is in is has come into existence to regulate this trade in endangered species, and and nobody disputes the effectiveness of their their job. It's simply these governments trying to move beyond it beyond their remit and and use highly emotionally charged arguments and uh, and yeah very emotional politics to try and enact this legislation which is it makes absolutely no sense there's been trench warfare about hunting for hundreds of years i mean if you read a, a copy of the field magazine for the mid 19th century we're basically hashing out the same arguments today i worry sometimes that you and me and the people we work with and the people who oppose us are, are, are just a kind of self-sustaining industry. You know, if we lost the antis, we'd have nowhere to go, Tristan. Well, <laughs> uh, well possibly, or, or we could all, you know, relax and go on holiday. Well, do, you see it, do you see it from the other side? I mean, do you, do you see the other side kind of almost not wanting to ban trophy hunting because it would have given them nothing to argue about, or are they absolutely fundamentalist about this and they want to get rid of it? Uh, I am of the view they are absolutely fundamentalist and want to get rid of it, uh, even from misguided points of view, but they are very crafty in the way they do it. If you look at the way, I mean, these questions, these polls that they use, they are framed in such a way that it manipulates the, the, you know, the result that they get in order to achieve their goals. And this is not fair. This is, this is, this is absolutely uh, ridiculous. And they, you know, if they wanted to have a fair fight on this, we could go to battle on that. But this is, you know, they are not playing fair. Uh, we've just seen uh, images of uh, my MP, Rebecca Power, who works for DEFRA, uh, and, and the contention I make in this film is she wants to replace wildlife with, with cattle. Is that, is that your view? Is that, is that something that resonates with European politicians, or do they just simply not get it? What, replacing wildlife with cattle? Yes. Uh, no, to, to a certain... We just had the... Uh, we just passed the, the nature restoration law in, uh, in the European Parliament, which was a very long... Uh, long effort, and a lot of the uh, the landowners and the farmers disagree with us on this. And but we felt, especially as hunters and conservationists, this is beneficial to have that restoration, especially for small bird population, small game bird so, populations. So that's, in that's Europe. replacing cattle yeah. with wildlife, yeah, to but, a certain extent. But trophy yeah. import bans are the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and you can, and is it not possible to get that across to the politicians? Uh, it's. Um, to, to certain polit well, to European politicians, um, no, they they see Africa as a very you know very different situation than what's happening in Europe. Even if in Europe, they are in favour of managing the deer population and sound game management, and even you know in Britain as well. If you say trophy hunting for Scottish stag is not not nearly seen as bad as uh, you know an African impala, when in effect it's exactly the same as as. The population difference between the, you know, between Scotland and the south of England. There's also, you know, the very different condition of animals. They have very differing numbers by region, and there is only so much nature which is there to sustain them. And and this is exactly the sort of, you know, short sightedness uh, geographically that people have that they see Africa as this magical uh, place, and uh, which is different from the nature in their own home backyard, which it actually isn't. Tristan Bryan from Face, thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you. Thank you.